Hey guys, I've got two interesting games to share with you today. Um, so I woke up this morning, I've played two games of 30 Minute Rapid, and we I had actually the same kind of thing happen in both games in that I lost material um, and went behind in material in the middle game. Um, but in both games I decided to, to fight on, so I'd like to take you through that process, help to spot what mistakes were made, um, but more than that, it's, um, it's a really important lesson to know that you can be behind in material, but that's not the only or the, the most important imbalance in a game, okay? Because you can have other strengths, even if you're behind in material. So let's just go, let's walk through these games. They're both um, against players rated, I think, just under 1,400. So um, this is game number one, E4 was played, E6, I'm playing the French, and then weirdly E5. I've never seen that before in my life. I play D5, going for my normal French structure, and white decides to take en passant, okay? That allows me to recapture with the C pawn, so I've now got two central pawns to white's one. So I'm thinking this is a, a weird way to start a game of chess, but um, I'm quite feeling quite comfortable. So d4 is played, I develop my knight, I'm getting ready to castle. c4, and then I play uh, b6 with the idea of um, developing my light squared bishop somewhere here. It's not going to have much of a future on this diagonal right now, so I'm thinking I want to be improving that bishop. Knight to c3, bishop to e7, knight to, knight to f3, and then I develop my bishop to a6. Um, this pawn's looking slightly vulnerable right now, and if this pawn moves and I get to capture that bishop, then either the rook or the king's going to have to recapture, and white is not going to be able to castle kingside. Plays b3, I castle, develops the bishop. I bring my rook across now to e8. Um, seeing that my opponent hasn't yet castled, but I expect him too soon, there he goes, he castles, and one of the other reasons why I developed that rook from f8 to e8 is because this I want some I want a job for this knight. Okay, it can't go there. Um, it hasn't got much scope at that point in the board. So I'm thinking maybe can can this knight come to d7, f8, and then g6, and really be part of my king's bodyguard there. So castles, knight to d7. Then he brings his knight in, so he's starting to have a poke around on, on my king side um, and this is definitely something that continues for much of the game is that white is trying to to get in uh, a solid attack to my king so i decide that knight to f8 now is good because he's got two pieces now lined up against h7 so he's got that knight and he's got that that bishop so i figure that putting both my knights there means that i've got two knights and a king defending that uh, key square. Brings his bishop back. I'm guessing this is going to be preparing queen to d3. So he's going to try and do some kind of brute force attack maybe. So now I move this knight back. Um, that is opening the way for the f-pawn to come out if I want to block there. And white plays f4 now which is an unusual move, I think. Um, it's definitely opening up his king at, to, to some degree. Remember, I've still got a queen and I've still got my dark square bishop on the board. So what he's done now is he's opened up this dark square diagonal to his king. So I move my queen to c7 with ideas of uh, maybe bringing my bishop there, my queen there, and then coming in with a checkmating attack, right? It's quite obvious, it's not a, a subtle attack, but any attack, if it's uh, going to be winning, is going to is going to force your opponent to have to respond. So, okay, queen comes now to h5. So now we've got three pieces. We've got the bishop, the knight, and the queen looking at h7. So, um, counting the defenders, we've got knight and then king, and the king cannot be... Uh, the last defender when there's still another attacker, right? Because it would be, let's say, knight takes, knight takes, bishop takes, no, not that one, 
bishop takes, and then king can't recapture because it would be moving into check. Okay, so the king can be your last defender in a tactical exchange, but only when there are no more attackers. Right. So I have to respond here. Um, I guess I could have moved my knight back to f6 possibly as a third defender. But I figured that the, the key piece here is this light square bishop looking down on there. So I, did, I decided to develop g6. It also comes with an attack on the queen. So I kick the queen. Queen moves forward to h6. Okay. Now I'm pushing my pawn forward. Um, potentially opening up this uh, dark square diagonal to the king. And then the other knight comes in. So my opponent is doing a good job here, I think, at... Um, attacking my position but at the same time you have to notice that that white's if you look at white's pawn structure now it's a bit all over the place so he's got this isolated pawn on the d file he's advanced the f pawn a little way um, there's a rook that's not in the game yet but he, he is doing a good job with his knight you know knights are close quarter fighters they need to be uh, getting close to your enemy king if they're going to be part of an attack. Okay, Pawn takes and then queen takes. So now there's an obvious threat. I've mate in one. Queen takes f1, checkmate. And white moves his rook there to f2. So now I can't go in there with my queen. So I grab the loose pawn, which also comes with an attack on the, the rook that's still on a1. So he's got to do something about that. Rook goes to b1. And now I play f5. Uh, there's no one passant option because there's no pawn on either of these squares. So that's coming with an attack on that knight. And now, this is what I missed. This is what I missed in that move. Bishop to b2. Okay, So he's putting this bishop on this awesome diagonal now. Because I've moved my pawns that far forward, This is these dark squares are weak, weak, weak. Okay. Um, so at this point in the game I was thinking a little too much I, I was paying attention to the queen and the knights and everything else I'd kind of ignored this bishop because it had been sat up there on, on c1 for I think the whole game so far um, so maybe I was focusing a little bit too much on my attack and how I could uh, execute my own plans and I missed this move and this move is pretty um, deadly so the bishop comes there the bishop's supported by the rook, and it's looking down this diagonal. Now, if I do anything, if I move my queen out of the way, wherever it goes, right, then white has queen to g7 mate. Okay, so this is what we call a sharp position. So it means that anyone can cut themselves almost. It's the, there are threats and dangers on both sides, and uh, when you're in a sharp position, same as any other kind of position the, the approach is the same you need to keep in your psychological zone you need to slow down you need to scan the whole board you need to consider your candidate moves and you need to decide which is the best one on balance okay so what do i do here i can't move my queen back anywhere on that diagonal because the bishop will just come and grab it okay i can't defend with my queen here um, if I move my bishop into the way, I mean, he's got, he can capture with a knight or he can just grab my queen. So I'm forced to capture the bishop. Okay, now this is putting me quite a way back in material. Um, however, I don't think, you know, it's not this kind of situation where if you lose your queen, you are done for. Okay, so rook takes and now basically I'm up two pawns but I'm down a big exchange. I've lost my queen, and I've, all I've got for it is a bishop. So in terms of material, my opponent is four points up right now. Okay, now I get to grab the, the knight with my pawn, so there's only one point in it. I've got two pawns and two minor pieces for the queen. Okay, so it's not the end of the world. Okay, Bishop grabs the pawn, attacking my rook. I push d5. Attacking the bishop back, bishop retreats. Okay, and now I get to. I'd, this is a move that I'd spotted. This is a move that White didn't spot, and it's very, very dangerous when you get um, a material advantage. Suddenly to think, ah, oh, 
you know, now I have to kind of rush and finish off the game. It's really important then to slow down. It's always important to slow down. Uh, look for all the patterns on the board that could indicate future tactics. And this is a very, very simple one. Okay, I've got a, light, a dark squared bishop. Black, sorry, white has got his king and his rook, two important pieces, on a dark diagonal. So I figure that this move is great because it attacks the bishop, it's a forcing move. White will have to do something with the bishop in order not to lose material. And when he moves, then I can get in bishop to c5. Uh, white can't do anything with that rook, so I come in, grab it. He recaptures with the other rook. And now material is, is actually equal. Okay, so although I've lost my queen by force, material is equal. So now I'm thinking, let's. Um, kind of sh see if I can shore up my defences by bringing my bishop maybe back to f5 where it can take the, the play the role of the missing pawn, take its place in the pawn structure and also preventing white's f pawn from advancing and opening up my position. Okay, uh, White has a knight very close to my king, white has the queen very close to my king, so what I have to do now is to um, keep my king as safe as possible and so I really really do not want these pawns to be moved I want to keep my pawns on the light squares because white has a light square bishop right so thinking this bishop to there is playing the role of a tall pawn so it's um, and it stops the f-pawn from advancing okay so um, this is interesting so he, he, uh, white moves his queen back to h3 and rather than dropping my bishop into there as planned, I decide to drop it back. There must be a reason for that, but I can't remember the reason right now. Okay, and the queen comes back. Now I move my rook in. So now I realize, okay, back rank checkmate tactics, okay? Now let's say rook goes to c1. What pieces can white move onto the back rank to block, okay? He's got bishop to d1, okay? It's unprotected on that square, so rook could just capture. He's got rook to f1, okay? But, if you notice, my bishop is looking at that diagonal, okay? So that's why the bishop was there. I'm preparing for this back rank attack, okay? So, white reads that, good job white, and decides to play h4 to give the king an escape square. And now, I see um, some potential, right? So first thing, Knight to f6 makes possible knight to g4 with a fork on the queen and the rook. Okay, uh, white doesn't spot this one, but now I go in. Okay, now it's this is this is pretty deadly. So I go in with a check. White shouldn't have blocked with the rook because there's two attackers on that rook, so that's just the free piece. Okay. And this is actually the end of the game. My opponent resigns at this point because what he realizes is the only move now is king to h2. I mean, okay, let's even say he played king to h2 before, right, for here instead of giving up the rook. But then I have knight to g4 with a fork against the king and the queen and the rook, okay, which would be pretty much winning. The game okay so let's just go back a little bit let's go back to the point at which um, I lose my queen okay so this 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 is the point okay now there's there's a free pawn here it looks like a free pawn uh, but what I missed was the rook coming back and this possibility I should have been conscious about this long diagonal okay so I grab the rook moves across, and I'm thinking, why is that rook moving across? Well, this is why. The rook is there to defend that bishop, control this long diagonal, with the threat, the immediate threat of checkmate in one, if my queen moves out the way, forcing the exchange. Okay. Now, that comes, so the move, my move before then was f5 attacking the knight, okay? Um, <clears throat> 
and this allows me to then to recapture material after the queen exchange okay so i'm forced to exchange he's forced to grab back then i grab the knight and i'm not too far behind so the the, the important thing now is to use the pieces that i have yes i'm slightly down in material okay but at this point i have both rooks i have both bishops i have both knights okay so the key is even if I'm down in material, it's how you use your material that matters. So I want to get all of my pieces involved in the game. I want to get all of my pieces involved now in harassing and attacking White's king. Okay, so grabs the pawn. I spot the, uh, the pin on the rook. Bishop moves. And now I win an exchange. Okay, so now material is actually equal. I manoeuvre my bishop round. So does White. I come back. So does White. And now we're looking at the back rank threat, right? You can't win a game of chess if you lose it first, right? So my bishop now on this diagonal is a key piece. White's king and knight there can't break through down here. And they've spent several moves trying to, trying to do that. Um, but... You know, I have this great mobility. So this knight is involved in, in defense. It's, it's there protecting h7. So is this one. Um, but my rooks and my bishop are now able to wreak havoc. And also this knight now on d7 becomes the key piece because it's going to come in here. So th th that's the, f the initial fork that I saw. But then I also realized that if my knight does get to g4, it's also covering this square, h2, which is the king's escape square. So how much does that really help white? Okay, knight comes back, not terribly effective, and this really is the, that's the end of the game and my opponent resigns. All right, so that's one. I lost my queen, went on to win the game. Okay, let's look at the, at the second game. So my opponent's rated 1355, and this time I'm playing with the white pieces. So e4, e5, knight to f3, knight to c6, d4 the scotch game black takes bishop to c4 the scotch gambit and now a quiet move h6 so the point of this move is obviously it's preventing the knight coming in there and and from there to f7 and the knight can't come here because it's already guarded by black's knight on c6 okay so in this position when a, a quiet move like that is played i uh, go ahead and castle Bishop comes out there. This is great because this opens up uh, opportunity for the Haxo Gambit. So c3, pawn takes, bishop takes on f7. Now normally, 90% no, of the time, the king will capture the bishop, okay? Which then enables queen to d5 check, winning back the other bishop. Black's king is exposed and has no castling rights. Okay, so in this instance, Black plays king to e7. So I go ahead anyway and attack the bishop and also defend my bishop on f7. Black plays pawn four to d6. I grab the pawn with my knight. And now uh, knight to f6 is played, kicking my queen. So my queen comes back to b3. Black's queen comes along to be a second attacker on the bishop. So now. We've got two, two attackers, queen and king, only one defender, my queen. So I come in with a check. Um, and I kind of like this move because I'm checking the king and I'm kind of tempting the king to capture the bishop because now this knight has blocked my queen's defense of the bishop. But if the king does do that, I can go ahead and say, grab the pawn on c7. Anything that I can do to most open the middle of the board is going to help me. My king is lovely and safe in, the, in his little corner down here. Right, He's got his defensive knight, he's got his rook there, he's got all three pawns nice and tight. So my king is in a happy situation. Um, if I can give black isolated pawns by, by capturing on here, maybe and grabbing the rook on the next move, um, it's all going to play into my hands strategically. I want the middle of the board to be cleared so that I can bring my rooks in and my queen and uh, give black some real headaches. So um, knight captures knight, bishop comes back to capture and 
Then bishop to d7, so he's looking to defend his knight. He doesn't want to have to, if I go for the exchange, he doesn't want to have to recapture with a b-pawn. I bring my bishop out to e3, offering an exchange. Black declines the exchange. And now I spot a, a pattern. So this is the thing. You've got two high value pieces and they are next to each other on the diagonal, which invites a knight attack. You can get a knight fork when you've got two pieces in that situation. Um, so then black spots this and plays queen to f6. Now I blunder. What you should do on every single move, every time your opponent moves, you have to say what has changed on the board, what is now attacked, what is undefended, etc, etc. Um, I failed to realise that queen to f6 came with an attack on my knight. Okay, I know. I know. Horrific blunder. Um, and I come up with some other idea and lose my knight. All right. Now at this point, I'm cursing. My wife's looking at me going, it's only a game. I know. But, you know, I'm thinking, look, I've done so well already in this game. I'm in a great position. I'm castled. My rooks are connected. My king is safe. Right? My, all my pieces are active in the middle of the board. Okay, this is a game for me to win. To win two out of two in the morning, right? That, and that would set me up very well for the day. And I'd gone and blundered a night, a whole night. Right, so I decide to grip my teeth and play on. In the last game, I still managed to squeeze a victory, even though I was down in material. Right now, I'm actually down more material. I'm three points down. So... I think, okay, let's look at the board. Although I'm down in material and that is an imbalance, okay, my opponent has an advantage in terms of material, but material is only material if you can use it, right? And so it's the, the activity of your pieces and the amount of pressure that you can execute um, on your opponent with your pieces matters way more than how many pieces you've got on the board, okay? Material is only material if you can make use of it. Okay, so queen comes there. My rook comes to e1 to defend my pawn. Maybe support a, a pawn push. Right, so we've got, for example, I've got maybe ideas of push the pawn. Let's say pawn takes, then I could capture the knight. And if he recaptures, I've got like rook to e5. You know, that lots, lots of ideas. Okay, black brings his rook across this is good this is bringing the e, the a8 rook into the game i decide to think about doubling my rooks on the e-file black's king starts to run away okay and now i'm thinking okay well if you're gonna head over that side to so the queen side of the board i'm going to start a, a pawn storm and try and winkle out that king and cause you some problems okay bishop to h3 this is a, a, a common attack when the pawn in front of the king is pinned, as it is in this case by the queen, then this bishop attack is usually very good. It's even better when the, when the rook is still next to the king, because um, in order to prevent checkmate there, you normally have to push this and then the bishop can grab the rook. Very common pattern. Uh, but now I can push g3 without losing my rook, and I'm okay. Bishop comes back, kicks the rook, rook comes to c2, Pawn starts coming down. I'm thinking I'm not having any of this. H4 puts an end to that idea. And now the queen comes back towards the king. Um, so here we've got a pawn on e4 with only one defender. However, you have to look at the order of the pieces. He's not going to capture with his queen and be, and be captured by a, a bishop, right? You, that just doesn't make sense. You don't give up a, a queen for a bishop and a pawn. Uh, but I bring my rook out anyway. Uh, my rook might as well play a part in the game. This pawn is looking a little uh, bare. Now, this, this is an interesting move. Rook to h7. And it's a move that I don't really understand, I have to confess. If you think about control of the board as well, right now this rook is controlling 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 squares. Okay. Um, when it moves here, it's going down to three squares. So it's really reducing its scope on the board. It's disconnecting itself from its uh, partner. So, and, and this turns out to be quite a material move. 
towards uh, later on in the game. Okay, so rook goes to there. I decide that now the light squared bishop has moved away because um, the bishop was there. Now the bishop's moved away. I can capture the knight on c6, and there's no bishop to recapture, so he has to recapture with a pawn, giving himself a third pawn island. So that's one, that's two, and, and that's three. Okay, three pawn islands on the board. Um, and I figure that's, that can only play to my advantage. So I push ahead. This pawn is, is defended by the bishop. I'm going to start causing some trouble and see if I can maybe even ideas of, of putting my queen there on b8. Um, but I don't do that yet. I, I want to bust open the middle of the board, push the pawn. Rook moves across. He's now got two attackers on that pawn. He's got the rook and the bishop. The pawn is pinned, so it cannot move. I've got two, two defenders in the form of my rook and my king. So it's not in his interest to initiate an exchange at this point in time, but he may be able to do more. So I capture with my pawn. Queen recaptures. Now I'm thinking... Hello, this looks like fun, because what do you spot, okay? You've got a king and a queen on the same uh, file. So the obvious move would be rook to d2 with a skewer on the queen. Now, this is not actually uh, as winning as it looks, because um, there are moves that are even more forcing than this. Okay, and one of those is check. If you can check your opponent, your opponent has to respond to the check. I have no time to capture that queen. Now, so bishop takes f2 check. My king cannot recapture the bishop because it's defended by the rook. And the threat is, this is a fork. If my king moves, then the bishop will capture the rook. So I'm... I evaluate this and I actually think, okay, well, let's let's figure this out. Let's say king moves, he captures the bishop, sorry, the rook. My rook takes queen, pawn takes back. So black there would win both of my rooks and and un uh, double these two pawns, which is not good for me. Okay, and two rooks is rooks are worth five points each. Um, two rooks are worth about the same as a queen. So do I really win in that situation? So I figure out that actually capturing the bishop is more in my interests than uh, going down that route and exchanging both rooks for a queen. So I capture with a rook, releasing black's queen. Uh, black comes in with an exchange. I, I go ahead with that quite happily. And now I'm also spotting another tactic. And can you see a, a fork? On the board right so I'm starting to eye up another way to win material and the key is that bizarre rook to h7 move okay so obviously what I'm thinking now I have to take care of my own king's safety there's a bishop there's a queen there's also a rook but look how useless this rook is right now it's got two two squares that it can move to that's it okay so black comes in with a check I'm not too concerned about this king can go to g2 okay and now I, I'm counting what checks checks are forcing moves what checks does black have okay it's got queen to f2 no good I, I take it with the king queen to g1 no good can be taken by the king or the rook um, it's got queen there I can capture force the exchange if I need to so I'm feeling fairly comfortable at this point I'm still eyeing up that queen to g8 thing okay now black spots the fork right so moves the rook out of the way also now giving the rook a lot more scope on the board but I come in with the check anyway because I, I realized that black only has one square to go to right can't block with the queen because it just loses the queen okay cannot retreat along the 8th rank because my queen is controlling the whole 8th rank. So the king now is forced to d7. I capture the pawn on g7 uh, again with a fork. So I'm forking the king and the rook. King goes back to c8 and now again I have to think quite carefully. Um, you don't want to just rush it and do that and then blunder your queen. 
So do I go ahead and grab the rook now, or do I maybe bring my rook in with another check? I go ahead and, and capture the rook. I think that that's the, uh, the most principled way to proceed. Um, black does come in with a check, but again, I'm not concerned because I, I figure out, I count all the possible subsequent checks that this queen has. That's no good. That's no good. And that's no good because that square is covered by two pieces, right? So queen comes in close quarters. I'm, I'm unconcerned again, and I decide to see if I can force the exchange to simplify which would be winning the game. I'm up a rook at this point in time. If I can get his queen off the board, then his opportunities for trapping and, and che uh, checkmating my king are going to be very slim. He declines the exchange, and now I play a6, and the purpose of a6 is to cover b7, right, which is the king's escape square, as we saw again in the last game. Okay, um, so the king has to do something because now uh, queen to e8 would be checkmate. So the king moves out, I come in, uh, forcing the king back to c8. And now this is an interesting move, okay? The obvious move would be queen to e8, right? Queen to e8 would be threatening check and it would actually force queen to d8. At that point then I could capture, black recaptures, and we've exchanged queens and I would probably almost certainly go on to win the game. However, I realized that by playing queen to f8 instead still forces this move. Right? The king cannot go there, cannot stay anywhere on the back rank. Right? Um, I guess could have come back, back here, but uh, so yeah, so that's what the king actually does. So now actually the queen cannot go to there because I've got rook to e8 winning the queen outright rather than exchanging queens. Both are probably winning, but one is slightly more elegant than the other. And then I come in with rook to d7 check. So now I guess I could have... Now I couldn't have won the queen, because... Hang on. Uh, so the king moves to there. Yeah, I mean, I, I could now move my rook with a discovered check, but... Um, yeah, actually, I guess rook to e5 would have been a, a good move because the king can't actually capture it. Rook to e5 uh, would have put the king in check from the queen, and I think the king would then have had to move back there and I could have grabbed the queen. So I didn't spot that one, but it's this winning combination. Anyway, uh, queen comes in, I exchange queens, and then it's just basically a, a, a case of simplifying the game. I'm just going around sweeping up um, pawns. That was the key one. That was the only pawn that could ever really be a danger. And then I decide to uh, sacrifice the exchange because I'm well ahead and there's no stopping this pawn from going ahead and becoming a queen. So the game ends in pretty straightforward fashion. Um, I'm not concerned now. I've got, I've got two pawns. Now his king is in the corner, and that can sometimes cause problems. You can have problems with stalemate, but I, I have a bishop that can maneuver and can cover half of the, the squares in that corner. It, it can address any of these dark squares. So um, I start pushing my pawns up, my opponent figures out then that the, the game is over and resigns the game. So what we've seen here is two examples, two games in succession where I have uh, lost material once with a, a very obvious blunder not uh, noticing the attack on my knight and the other one uh, was a slightly more subtle move with a very good move by my opponent that I also allowed and didn't see but the key thing is if you can make sure that your pieces are developed earlier on in the game that your pieces have activity that they're covering the board you've always got options Right? So material is only material if it's activated. Okay? Um, so in both of these games, I was able to use the advantage that I had uh, by my, bringing my remaining pieces, working all together as a team to uh, attack my opponent and manage to, to win both. So I hope that's been useful for you, and I will see you next time.